In a previous video we did here at Tech Yes City, we took a look at the Z200 workstation series and how you can use them for gaming on a budget. But here on the desk, we've got the Z620 workstation. Now, the thing about these is that they're generally more expensive. If you go on eBay and look for one of these, you can be paying up to 350 USD and in Australia, 500 AUD and upwards. Though for that extra money, what exactly do you get? And how does it differ from the Z200 workstation series if you want to make a budget gaming rig? Let's take a look and explain all in today's video. But before we do that, a quick word from today's video sponsor. If you're looking for a single end Windows 10 Pro user license for as little as 15 US dollars, then use the link below from SCD Keys, whack that coupon code in, TYCSK, and you'll save yourself 12% on checkout. You then get your key, which is usually instant delivery, whack it in, click activate, and you've now got rid of that annoying Windows 10 needs activation logo. Links in description below. So it all began for this series with the original Z600, and this was the business counterpart to the Enthusiast X58, which is very dear and beloved in the community of enthusiasts. That being said, what made this series so special versus say the Z200 series is that it supported ECC registered memory and you usually got more memory support in total. Also, since the RAM is ECC and registered, it is tailored towards people who can't afford to have that very rare once in a blue moon crash. Though these systems generally had an entry starting point of $1,650. And then this series would be superseded by the one that we have here on the desk. That is the Z620. This came in both Sandy Bridge and then later Ivy Bridge formulas, where it supported up to 96 gigabytes of ECC registered memory. As for the chipset, we had the C602, and just like the one before at the 5520, it's essentially the workstation counterpart to the Enthusiast X79. Though with these business grade motherboards, there was generally no overclocking allowed. However, one thing that was cool about this era, especially the first generation of the Z620 workstation, was that it had a firewire on the front and back which is something that was being phased out in the X58 era, but it still managed to make its way to the Z620 workstation. There was also some cool new technologies introduced at this time, USB 3.0 at the front. And another cool thing was this was officially when PCI 3.0 X16 slots were introduced. Despite people telling you that it was actually introduced on Ivy Bridge, it actually came out on Sandy Bridge EP. Though after the Z620 came the last of its kind, the Z640. And this used the C612 chipset, which again was the business counterpart to the Enthusiast Great X99. Now here you saw DDR4 being implemented, as well as those V3 Haswells, which supported up to 18 cores 36 threads on a single socket solution. Though the sweet spot here is easily the Z620s, as the Z600s are generally considered outdated, and the Z640s are generally considered way too expensive. So besides the negatives of it being more pricier than a Z6200 series, it is also a lot heavier. So if you plan on lugging this around to LAN parties or you just like to move your PC and do some exercise with it, then this will generally be a bit heavier and could be a bit more strenuous than using say a Z200 workstation. Though those negatives out of the way, there is a lot of pros about this. First being the power supplies fitted in these things. In the unit I've got here today, we've got an 800 watt power supply. It is absolutely massive. It'll power things like an RTX 2080 Ti, even an OC edition, absolutely no problems. And now they also on these units use really high grade power supplies. So the efficiency is not only high, but the power delivery is also very consistent. However, if you did follow us on Twitter, I did tease something that was really unorthodox. And that is, I was testing out the sense wires on graphics cards that needed eight pins. Because this unit only comes with two six pin adapters, or at least the model I got here, I had to improvise a little bit. And that if I use cable extenders, they actually weren't long enough. And since it's very hard to take off the back panel of this case, I then decided to try a new trick. And that was just wire up two sense wires and then solder it onto the bottom of the case. Obviously the test pilot does look a lot worse, but it was just a concept that actually ended up working. So if you wanna get around that eight pin dilemma, like I did here, then you can generally get your soldering iron out and have a little bit of fun. Another thing that honestly blows me away about these Z600 workstations is quite simply the cooling. Even on this Z620 workstation here, the Sandy Bridge era, we've got active cooling over our memory, as well as two outtake fans, which do an extremely good job of cooling. When I tested the CPU temperatures, we actually came in three degrees lower than leaving the side panel off, 
which means that HP, even back in the day, definitely contracted someone who knew what they were doing to make this case design. And the good thing is, the noise is also really well controlled. I'll let you guys have a quick listen while we're doing some benchmarks. Though those GPU numbers, another good thing there, was that we averaged out at 73 degrees, both with the side panel on and off. And this is with an open air MSI overclocked edition 980. So the power supply is good, the cooling's good, and also the room inside allows you to put in those extra extended graphics cards. Now, unfortunately with the unit I had here, you may have noticed one more thing, and that was I was uh, using a little bracket to support the SSD. And that's because the person I bought it off didn't include any of the extra hard drive base. So again, I had to improvise a little bit. But what we've ended up here with is a system, if the drives are already installed, all you generally have to do is add your graphics card in and you've got one of the easiest pre-built PCs you could make in your life. Though the last thing to talk about is the actual specs in this system here. And what we've got is a Xeon 1620 or basically an i7-3820 equivalent in that also we can't overclock on this workstation system, which is another little negative. However, it's not that bad of a deal since we do have also quad channel memory on our memory itself. So this means we're gonna get a lot more bandwidth in that we don't have to really worry about overclocking our memory per se. But of course the CPU speeds, I would like to see if I could get a little bit more out of that. But for me personally, and the 350 Aussie dollars that I paid for this system, that's really not a big negative because we're gonna now couple it with a GTX 980 and then run some benchmarks for you guys and then see how that fared against the 9900K, but also the previous Z200 workstation series that we tested and that was with a GTX 1070. Let the benchmarks begin. <laughs> Now, sometimes a real PC needs to be owned by a real man. What do you got to say about that, Dabin? Well, that's why this is my PC. And with the benchmarks out of the way, we have a system here that is running really smoothly, at least with the games and the limitations set by the GTX 980. When it came to F1 2019, the card performed really well, at least compared to the other cards in the benchmark, and going up to a 9900K really didn't represent any extra FPS. Now the GPU was already being maxed and that was the limiting factor. Moving over to Call of Duty Warzone showed that the GPU was yet again being utilized to its max potential, but it was a far cry from being anywhere close to a GTX 1070, as well as say a GTX 1650 Super and a 5500 XT meaning that optimizations for the GTX 900 series, and I'm guessing predecessor models, is just not there. Though the worst case scenario for this graphics card, but also the CPU, was Shadow of the Tomb Raider, where I couldn't even get this game to run in DX12, unfortunately, but when we ran it in DX11, we did see a lower FPS, and then when we stepped up to the 9900K, we did get quite a big boost, but it was still, again, way off that of a GTX 1070. As for the 1% and 0.1% lows, it was a really smooth experience on this PC. So in 2020, this combo right here can still get up and boogie. The idle power consumption was around about 100 watts, and then when we stepped it up to Call of Duty Warzone, it was juicing around 310 watts from the wall. So what we've got here ultimately with the Z600 series, especially with the Z620 on the desk, is something that has great temperatures and that the case has got really good airflow. Both CPU and GPU temperatures are really well controlled. You've also got the option to add more cores. If you want to step it up to say an eight core Xeon, you can do that even with a V2. Though some more good news with this system is since it had Windows 7 Pro originally, that enables us to then activate Windows 10 Pro for free. And of course, it's a really quiet system in operation. The power supply is phenomenal, and it even comes included with a speaker built into the desktop itself. Though although I picked up this system for a really good deal, the Z600 series is actually quite expensive even to this date. And the reason being, it's still a flagship system in its class, and that the Z600s were the flagship of the single socket solution. Then we had the Z800 series, which is the dual socket system solutions. And so what you're seeing here is that people who bought these back in the day for quite a sizable sum are probably still happy with them in that it can still do all the things they need it to, whether it's video editing or producing music. So instead of that said person going out and buying a new higher end system, which will probably cost them a lot of money, they then just decide to replace the parts that have gone faulty, or of course they may want to get some upgrades and get more life out of this thing. 
So that now leads us to the question of, should you consider buying a Z620 in 2020? And my answer is, if you can get it for a deal, especially locally, then definitely yes. It's a clean system, runs quiet, great temperatures, and of course it can support higher end graphics cards, which the Z200 couldn't. That was more capped out at mid-range graphics cards. And another really good thing, at least for the Z620 workstation, even versus the Z640, is that it supports the DDR3 registered ECC memory, which is generally really cheap on the used market. So you can get 32 gigabytes, have it in quad channel, and you'll be getting really smooth frame rates with even something like an RTX 2060 Super. Though with all that out of the way, do let us know in the comments section below what you think of the Z620. If you came by one, would you pick it up? If so, why? If not, why not? Love reading your thoughts and opinions as always, just like this question of the day here, which comes from Devon Rack. Let's try that again. It comes from Devon Rajakaruna, and they ask, hey, I live in Australia, and where did you get a power supply for 10 Aussie dollars? I can only find them for around 60 at least. Thanks. And they're referring to this video, I'll put the link up here, where I picked up a decent power supply for 10 Aussie dollars. But the problem with that was that was over a few months ago. And since then, the whole market has gone completely haywire. And that's probably even an understatement. So if you're looking for a power supply nowadays, even on the used market and it's of decent quality, you can expect to pay a bit more than 10 Aussie dollars. So of course, with that in mind, if you do come into a bargain, then always be quick on that and snap it up. Anyhow, I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. If you enjoyed this one, then you know what to do. And also if you stayed this far and you're not yet subbed and you're enjoying that content, sub button, ring that bell to get the content as soon as it drops. And I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye. And dad man, finally this video is finito el dito. Do you know what that means in English? That means it's finished. Finally, I found someone who understands my Spanish. Thank you.